Um, I want to thank, on behalf of Ron Rebest, Adi Shamir, and myself, the ACM, Intel Corporation, uh, the community of researchers, our friends, our teachers for this great honor. The award has special meaning for us because of the course of Turing's own research career. So recall that Turing, in 1936, when he was just 24 years old, uh, published his famous paper on Hilbert's Entscheidung's problem, his decision problem. And that's where he introduced the Turing machine. Uh, this amazingly simple device which could do such amazing things. And in fact, apparently captured precisely the notion of what it meant to compute. So that 1936 paper arguably is the beginning of our discipline. Remarkably, just two years later, in 1938, apparently in anticipation of the coming war, uh, Turing went to work doing cryptology uh, for the British government. And when the war did begin, he went to Bletchley Park, uh, where he began work on the Enigma machine and was successful in cracking it using his new ideas about the nature of computation, building what is called the bomb, a sort of electrical uh, mechanical device. Uh, this kind of mixing of theoretical mathematics with cryptology occurs many times and is, of course, in some small way reflected in our own work. Uh, here's an overview of our talk. I will speak about the pre-RSA days, so essentially the theoretical and cryptologic developments that lead up to RSA. Uh, Ron will speak about RSA and the early days, and then Adi will give us a status report on cryptology. So uh, to get underway, I want to give a brief history of number theory. It all seems to have begun about 2,300 years ago when the Greeks uh, when the Greeks apparently discovered some form of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that each number can be written as a product of a unique set of primes. Uh, this is a gateway concept in number theory. Uh, primes are to number theory as elements are to chemistry. You can't be doing number theory seriously, mathematically, until you pass this gateway. And, and the Greeks seem to be the ones who did. Uh, this is a picture of Eratosthenes, who uh, was the first one to ever give an algorithm to test primality and a factor, actually. And that's his famous sieve. Right. Unfortunately, things didn't develop very rapidly from that point on. It was only in around 1200 that Fibonacci was to begin writing on uh, number theory and was to note that one could stop sieving when the square root of the number of interest was reached. By the 1800s, uh, the problem of distinguishing prime numbers from composite numbers, finding an algorithm for primality, was actually one of the most celebrated problems in all of mathematics. And it attracted the attention of many great mathematicians, including the greatest of all, uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, the prince of mathematics. And in his masterpiece of 1801, uh, Disquisitionis Arithmetica, he would give several algorithms to test primality. And by the way, he's the first that I know of to ever say that the primality testing problem and factoring problem were not the same problem, a distinction which becomes very important to RSA later. And he gives two algorithms for testing primality, which he says will please lovers of arithmetic. And indeed, they're very pleasing if you happen to like incredibly beautiful mathematical ideas. But if you're looking for a fast general purpose algorithm, you're going to be less pleased because these aren't it. And much is done in the about 200 years that follow Gauss. Now I want to turn to cryptology. Uh, the origins of cryptology are much more obscure. Uh, it appears as if secret writing arose many places at many different times. But at least about 2,700 years ago, the Spartans had developed what we now call transposition ciphers. And in particular, they had the citale, which consisted of a ribbon of papyrus wrapped around a stick. The message of interest was written across the stick. And then when the ribbon was unwound, the result would be that the position of the letters had been transposed. 
when presumably you could only read the message if you had a stick of the same diameter as the original to wrap the uh, papyrus around again. By the time of Caesar, uh, a second type of cipher is known, the so-called substitution cipher, in which a new letter is substituted for each letter of the original message. This idea of substitution cipher would be generalized and generalized through time. By the time you get to uh, uh, the 1500s, Viginaire has made what are called polyalphabetic substitutions. And by the time you get to the uh, 20th century, Vernon has developed what is called the one-time pad. Interestingly, uh, the Viginaire cipher seems to have withstood cryptanalytic attack for about 300 years when it was finally broken by Anybody know? It turns out it was broken by Charles Babbage, the man who uh, invented the analytic engine and perhaps could be argued as a, a father of computer science. Um, and uh, then in 1948, there was a huge breakthrough, and that's when Claude Shannon published his famous paper, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, wherein he began the field of information theory. The next year, he published a uh, result in his new information theory, which showed that the Bernam uh, cipher, the one-time pad, was in fact absolutely unbreakable, the first sort of proof of unbreakability ever. So uh, here we have these two fields which have accumulated the wisdom of thousands of years of human intellectual effort. But if we look at 1970, in retrospect, we can see that something was missing. Uh, for example, in 1973, if you asked what was the fastest general purpose primality testing algorithm, the answer was there was none faster than the one described by Fibonacci. And his be, it was only a minor improvement of the original one begun by Eratosthenes. So what was missing? what was needed to sort of unleash all this intellectual potential and bring forth a stream of new invention. What was missing was the proverbial butterfly to flap its wings. Thank you. Uh, and that happened in the mid-1960s with the invention of a new field, computational complexity. Now, computational complexity is probably the finest idea in computation uh, since uh, Turing's original ideas. And computational complexity has many fathers, not all of whom are shown here. Um, they include uh, Michael Rabin, they include Leonid Levin, Edmonds, Fisher, uh, Ullman, Hopcroft, uh, Aho, and I could go on. But the field gets its name uh, from a paper written in 1965 by Hartmanis and Stearns on the computational complexity of algorithms. And in 1967, Manuel Blum publishes his PhD thesis, A Machine Independent Theory of the Complexity of Recursive Functions, which puts computational complexity in a broader theoretical framework. Uh, he is followed by Stephen Cook, who in 1970 uh, publishes his paper, The Complexity of Theorem Proving Procedures, which describes the class NP and the notion of NP completeness, also independently described by Levin. Uh, and then just a year later is Karp's uh, remarkable paper, Reducibility Among Combinatorial Problems, uh, wherein uh, it's made clear that this notion, this way of viewing computation is central to our discipline. This butterfly flapping its wings had a huge impact on both the fields of number theory and cryptology. In number theory, uh, we suddenly had the tools to look at problems and try to classify them according to their complexity. We could look at algorithms and accurately analyze how fast they ran for the first time in history. And for young researchers in uh, number theory and theoretical computer science, such as myself and Gary Miller here, um, this was like a license to steal. Because we could go back to thousands of years of great intellectual effort and look at the ideas of our predecessors and 
cull from all their ideas, those which had computational complexity potential, and reject those, no matter how mathematically beautiful, that didn't seem to have computational complexity potential. And we could cut and paste them into new algorithms, new efficient ones. And this engendered a golden age in algorithmic number theory. In fact, uh, I would say this is the, this engendered the high point in the history of man in algorithmic number theory, and it goes on uh, today as well. Um, at any rate, by 1975, we now have uh, Solovay Strassen's results, uh, which say that the composites are in random polynomial time. What this means, practically, is we can now distinguish prime numbers from composite numbers and do it quickly. Uh, we also have, by 1975, looked at the algorithms for factoring, looked at all the ideas that were out there, and analyzed them and realized that polynomial time algorithms for factoring did not exist. Not that they might not exist in the future, but they didn't exist then. Now, in cryptology, this idea of computational complexity also had a huge impact. Among other things, it said that a notion, a new notion, could be made sense of. The notion that a code could be unbreakable, not for the reasons that Shannon had, that there was not enough information to break the code, but rather there wasn't enough time to break the code. So this was a brand new idea. And in another interaction with cryptology, this idea interacted with three researchers interested in the future of cryptology in an electronic age. And that's the Stanford group and our friends, uh, Whit Diffie, Marty Hellman, and Ralph Merkel. And so they, in 1976, produced the idea of a public key crypto system, arguably the greatest idea in the history of cryptology. So we have these three disciplines, number theory, computational complexity, and cryptology, all coming together. New ideas are all about in algorithmic number theory and in cryptology. And essentially, this sets the table for the talks that uh, my colleagues will give. But before I, I leave the topic, I want to uh, acknowledge these gentlemen. Uh, it has recently come out that it GCHQ, the uh, British cryptologic agency that followed Bletchley Park. Um, these researchers, Clifford Cox, uh, James Ellis, and uh, uh, Malcolm Williamson, apparently uh, developed many of the ideas of public key cryptology and RSA in secret, but they deserve to be uh, honored as well. Uh, finally, I have a couple of pictures of Ron and Adi and I. Uh, not taken at the same time, it turns out. They, uh, w the top one was taken probably 20 or 25 years ago, and the bottom one about a couple of months ago. And the discerning eye can see some change, but <laughs> one, thing, one thing that hasn't changed is we're still smiling. And, uh, and why shouldn't we be? Uh, we've got We've been friends for over a quarter of a century, and we've got to sit together and discuss some of the greatest ideas that man has ever had in mathematics and cryptography and in uh, other areas like uh, physics and biology. And so I want to thank my two friends and colleagues for the great joy they've brought to my life. Thank you, guys. Um, That was my penultimate remark. Uh, my final remark is I want to thank America. And uh, this is a place where I've been given the freedom to explore whatever ideas I wanted to explore. And I've been nurtured in that exploration. And when some degree of success has been achieved, uh, been rewarded so richly as we're being rewarded tonight. So thank you very much.